Hello, good morning, and thank you. Um, thank you to uh, the city of Los Angeles for hosting this. It's always great to see Enrique and Adele at the helm. Um, thank you to Will and Deb Dietz for helping put this together. And I'm here to talk about low impact development. Uh, I'm going to play the role as the engineer um, and go through a couple of very dry, boring engineering slides. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, essentially, do I have to advance this? So a, a series of slides that will show uh, multiple different types of LID implementations. The format would normally be a cross section, and then there will be a, a plan view, maybe two cross sections, it depends. Um, this wor the imagery you'll see was, was developed with the National Cooperative Highway uh, Research Program. Um, so low impact development, um, very aptly named to provide us all with a bit of flexibility. We didn't say zero impact development. And as uh, Mike just mentioned, you know, what is low impact development? So there's flexibility there. It's low-ish develop impact development. I just missed something there that I'm going to go back to. I should have made this slide a little later. Um, each uh, implementation has uh, a set of things that are part of it. Um, there's conveyance. You've got to get water to it. Uh, Pre-treatment, if possible. Storage, of course, to hold the water. Uh, the ability to dissipate the water through either infiltration, filtration and release, uh, evapotranspiration, and an overflow bypass in case too much water gets to your system. Um, and the reason I wanted to point this one out is this actually has a detail for an up, upturned elbow, which allows for ponding to occur if infiltration is not happening. Uh, that will create an anaerobic zone to help treat uh, nutrients um, through a, a nitrification process if the downstream water body is polluted um, for nutrients. Um, so here's the plan view of it. Getting back to my talk, um, low impact development. It's a philosophy we all learned. It's a, it's a, it's a way of doing things. Um, in my world, they're things. These are actual containers in the environment that we are designing and developing and putting in place. Um, be them uh, st stone storage, reservoirs that we call infiltration trenches. Um, they're things. If you don't compact your, your site, so through like the LEED program, and you need to maintain uh, minimal compaction of your site, you've actually created little spaces in the soil that allows the water to percolate. So these are things, storage containers. Um, as I mentioned, they all have a common set of, of aspects. They're the, the, the conveyance to there, uh, the pretreatment, the dissipation, filtration, this is an important aspect. Um, a lot of really beautiful designs are produced uh, in, uh, with, with the help of the landscape architects or it, with landscape architects at the helm. Um, but we've got to make sure that they work. The point of low impact development actually was developed to improve water quality. Um, if you have a very nice system that the water goes through and it's a little dry creek and it flows back out to the street and down, you really didn't do a lot for that water quality improvement. You did a little bit, but again, low impact development, there's some flexibility. However, I think with the ordinances and, and trying to help the city with their enhanced watershed management planning process, or with LADWP, with their stormwater capture management plan, master plan, uh, we need to do uh, better. We need to make these things effective. Um, so again, I mentioned that they're here to develop uh, uh, water quality improvements. Um, they're to here to provide water conservation and, if appropriate, located uh, water supply and to assist uh, with hydro modification, which is a, a term which is probably not very familiar to us here in Los Angeles because it's hard to hydro modify a concrete channel. But in other places where development is going in, uh, into the foothills, um, there is a requirement now to not let your, your post-construction runoff uh, affect that or be changed or altered from the pre-construction stream flows. So these are other ways to hold the water and release them at a later date. I don't even know where I am and um, hopefully you've been looking at these things from the CHRP. Um, but um, what I really wanted to really end with here is the upcoming challenges or the, uh, the challenging challenges that continue to remain. Um, we still need to locate these proper designs 
uh, properly sized. So there's a design storm that equates to that storage volume, your conveyances, your overflow, your filtration rates, um, and in proper locations. Don't design an infiltration facility when your place is on clay. Or don't uh, design a container that is, uh, has a hard bottom in a place that is conducive to infiltration and also feeds the groundwater aquifers. So there's a way to put these things in the right places and the right designs. Again, I mentioned LEDWP's stormwater capture master plan and the EWIMP process that LA SAN is going through, and these things do need to be uh, coordinated. Um, but one of the things that, as, as uh, Mike just went through, uh, which is interesting, is this, uh, the, the hierarchy that, number one, infiltration is first. Number two, uh, uh, beneficial use or reuse. Um, use, I think, should be used because the reuse starts to move it towards uh, Title 22 standards. And, and then three is treat and release. Um, this has an inherent problem with water bodies that have, again, the driver, the main driver for these are um, uh, water quality uh, improvements in the receiving water bodies. And there is a sometimes toxic substance or, or soup flowing down our creeks that don't support the habitat that is one of the beneficial uses of our waterways. And if infiltration is the number one priority, and you're doing it in all locations, what you're doing is removing pollutant loading from the rivers and the streams, so there is less pollutants moving down the creeks, but you're also removing the water as well, so you're not changing really the concentration of the toxicity in the water body itself. And so it's a, it, it will, if you can remove all water from the waterway, it will no longer have that toxic soup flowing down it. But there needs to be some places where we understand that there are some additional intrinsic values of, of habitat and other qualities coupled in those areas where um, the infiltration is not conducive for water supply, because that is also a beneficial use, that we do start going back to those treat and release. And I think this is a place where the landscape architects can really play a good role in making these beautiful designs that are fitting for either residential, multifamily residential, park spaces, and making sure that they're effective at, at treating the water before releasing them back into the water bodies to which they flow eventually to the Pacific Ocean. Oh, and finally, we have treat and reuse here where <laughs> we capture the water and it is able to be pulled up and either discharged back to the water body um, or perhaps um, beneficially used on site which I think is, a, is another great option, and I think there is a large market available for that, especially in areas that aren't overlying the, uh, the San Fernando Basin or those areas that access the Central and West Coast basins. I've always dreamed of getting permission, and somebody can do it, to come out and paint on the street what's under the street, so people can visualize what's there. And the opportunity to visualize these systems for people, whether it's online or in an app or literally out in the landscape is something that I think would be really important for us to do on the educational side of all of this. So I would just throw that out there in response to that question. Okay. Any other questions? Um, actually, you made a really good point about if, if, if the filtration were possible everywhere, um, you know, we wouldn't have anything flowing in our, our streams. But, you know, it's not gonna be possible everywhere, so we will have something flowing in our streams, and if it's untreated, it's gonna be pretty ugly, uh, or potentially pretty ugly, especially if anything in the way gives driver the flow. So, with that said, do you envision at some point, you know, due to this infiltration kind of being the, the top tier, uh, do you envision, um, in-stream water rights coming about, I mean, maybe not in Los Angeles, but in other areas, um, you know, just to deal with that same issue? Just to understand the question, are you talking about taking water out of the streams and treating it and then using it, or are you talking about parcel base, keeping your water on site, and then now you might be affecting someone's downstream water rights? Right, it's not really necessarily water rights, but it'd be habitat water rights, more like, more like what you see in Seattle and Portland where they have Stream water rights for salmon, things like yes. And and California has that as well. It's it's a seven t 
17, it's in the 1700 series, where a water rights holder can actually say, uh, my water rights are going to support in-stream habitat. And so they, you can actually make that choice, and that's what's going on um, in Oregon as well. People are actually applying their, uh, their um, water rights back into the stream. The State Water Resource Control Board also, and Fish and Game, or Fish and Wildlife now, have also collaborated on in-stream flow, uh, you know, minimum in-stream flow standards in the state. So it's not really a water right, but it's saying, hey, we can't go below this value. Um, one of the issues here in Los Angeles, though, is we have ephemeral streams, and you see a lot of these pictures of, of stream restoration and um, what can be in our creeks and channels. Um, but we need to remember that a lot of times, now there are some places that always flowed perennially, um, but there are also, you know, the Royal Seco. It's, it's that exactly by definition means dry wash, I think, a Royal. I know Seco means dry, though. Um, <laughs> these are, these are uh, ephemeral systems, so um, and the other question about like, is it, is, should we call it green streets? I thought the succulent streets was a great answer. But sage, you know, and, and I was talking with uh, Virginia from LADWP, how um, the uh, LA County Flood Control District, the whole place, the, the lawn that surrounds that tall tower has gone brown and they've got signs that say brown is the new green. It's, it, we do need to get into that understanding, at least in Los Angeles, that maybe wet, perennially flowing streams aren't exactly what we're trying to achieve. Um, but I don't know if I've even come close to answering your question. I know that in Colorado, they changed an entire policy that allowed for people to do low impact development in rain barrels and cisterns because there was a, a law that said that water is actually owned by downstream people such as us in California. Right, I guess I was thinking about more of a, a habitat issue as opposed to actual water rights. Right. But you know, because there's two conflicting ideas. One is taking the water and putting it in the ground, and the other is letting it, it cleaning it and putting it in the stream. Right. So, but historically, and that's what low impact development is supposed to do, is create a post condition that operated as the pre-development condition did. Now, what does pre-development mean? Does that mean last month? Does that mean 10 years ago? Or does that mean pre, you know, habitation by um, masses? Um, so like the San Fernando Valley used to flow uh, very, you know, the, the rains would fall. Most of that would never make it to a channel, except for what would come out of the mountains. And that would wash out and it would perk into the ground. Only during those wet times or when the groundwater levels were very high would that water actually reach and connect the, the Pacoima Wash and the Tonga Wash would actually reach the LA River. It wouldn't always reach the LA River because it would disappear into the ground and it would create those Arroyo Seco type systems. Right, so as long as we still function on the fundamental idea of pre versus post, then we're actually still achieving what we think we're supposed to be doing, regardless if we call it low impact development or green streets programs or, or what, what have you. Right, exactly. And, and yes, in a, in a perfect world, I think that's kind of what we all want. That's why people habitated down here in the first place was because it's a, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, but I, I do think that the uh, low impact development, uh, ne the, the main purpose was to improve water quality. So these beautiful designs that I see, and I work with a lot of landscape architects in doing it, and I'm like, this is fantastic. There needs to be a, a, an understanding that the main purpose of these is to actually improve water quality uh, to uh, also help with water supply, water conservation, and hydro modification. So um, designs do need to have that critical review that, hey, filtration is, is a big part of this, or an upturned elbow to make sure that you're, you're denitrifying, you know, you have the, the denitrification process going on before you release it to nutrient impaired water bodies downstream.